Hello, everybody. It is the American Doofus Show. Don't be a doofus. Welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing the episode. As with all of his interviews that he's conducted since he's been arrested, we have uh, this episode to rebroadcast the most recent interview with Grandmaster Jay. This was on the 9 p.m. Galinsky show on uh, YouTube. And um, we're going to be doing excerpts from the video. If you want to see the video in its entirety, uh, one location you can find it is at uh, Drop Dime. Uh, actually, Drop Dime and uh, Michi X are both uh, really good sources for information for, from, or about uh, Grandmaster Jay. And uh, for those that don't know, Grandmaster Jay is the leader of the NFAC, the Not Fucking Around Coalition. And uh, the NFAC is one of four national militias recognized by the Southern Poverty Law Center as having a national presence. The other three are the Oath Keepers, Constitutional Sheriffs, and the Three Percenters. Grandmaster Jay is currently uh, been arrested for gun charges on both the federal and state level. He will be arraigned in uh, Kentucky State Court today, Friday the 18th of December. We'll have that information as it becomes available. And of course, later on, we'll be talking about what we are about to see in this interview. Without further ado, here are the words of Grandmaster Jay. Cautiously here, because I don't want to say anything that would jeopardize of the case, uh, but just to give you the high level, um, uh, I was surprised when I was uh, arrested by an FBI task force, which is part of a new task force that was created by the U.S. government a couple of months ago. I think it's back in, um, I think it might have been earlier than that, it might have been June, July, but they were given the mission of targeting uh, groups that espouse what they called an anti-government theology. You'll hear that term coming out now. Uh, these were the folks you saw riding around in Portland, snatching folks off the street, a kind of quasi-military unit. It's actually what visited me, along with uh, other members of law enforcement, I was arrested. Uh, and I was actually uh, told that I had um, apparently been uh, accused of pointing a weapon at police officers, which was completely out of left field for me. I'm like, well, when did this happen? Because in America, we have a track record that proves that well, to be honest, black men pointing weapons at police officers or federal agents doesn't end well for the black person. We've got people who've been shot for less. Matter of fact, we just had a young man who was shot over a sandwich. So you, if this was completely out of left field, but that was the accusation, uh, and that was the charge uh, from the federal level. And then the, the, the state of Kentucky uh, decided to pile on to that and add the same charge uh, that they charged uh, the officer who fired shots into the home of Breonna Taylor killing her. They charged him with wanton endangerment. They charged me with that also. Apparently, I wantonly endangered someone uh, when I shined a flashlight, uh, at, allegedly, at these, uh, these officers that they're telling me that they are. This was the accusation. And, uh, of course, uh, I was. everyone says these charges are trumped up because they said this happened back in September um, when we were there for the derby. Uh, for this. If anyone knows anything about the NFAC, uh, we were returning uh, to Louisville to apply more pressure on the legislature, the government, law enforcement to resolve the Breonna Taylor case, uh, which had been dragging on for God knows how long. Uh, and, and during this time, this is when it was alleged that I had done this incident, yet they did not come to see me and arrest me and uh, bring a task force to my home to confiscate all of my weapons. Uh, and anything related to integrating um, to, uh, to 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 come get me now on the uh, at, at the beginning of December. Uh, there's some there's some real questions there because uh, it's not like I haven't been back to law. It's not like I haven't been in the presence of law enforcement, including the new police chief. So I find it interesting that you know this happens. So this is the situation we're in right now. So I'm looking at a fighting two cases, uh, one at the federal level, one at the state level, uh, which has gotten a lot of attention because of who it was that was targeted, and the fact that it screams in the face of inequality when you look at the behavior of some past militia members of, of white persuasion who managed to point guns at federal officials, uh, uh, storm state houses, take over federal buildings, and we saw none of this. 
uh, so it, it, it raises a, a bunch of questions that we hope to answer as we move through this process. You know, the, the charges are what they are, and the, the federal process follows its process as it does. There's nothing new here. What we found interesting was that one of the conditions of me being released from federal custody was that I would not uh, conduct activities on social media specifically social media, not the internet, but social media. And when I heard this, you know, the question was raised, why? Well, what's, what's the deal with social media? What does social media have to do with this entire affair? Well, the answer was this is just one of the conditions. You can either accept it or you can stay in federal custody. So, of course, thinking that we'll, we'll fight this matter in court, I went ahead and agreed to it, but I've been silent on social media. Here's the catch. The catch to it is this. Why was it important to add that? Well, you have to remember that outside of the NFAC, I'm very popular uh, as an internet um, personality, so to speak. I have a, a radio show that I do called Facts Over Feelings and another morning show that I do called uh, The Morning Mental. Uh, which, uh, you know, depending on, you know, your religious preference or your knowledge of history, maybe you may not be your cup of tea. But at the end of the day, there's a huge following there. And it was those people who put pressure on law enforcement, put pressure on the system, made phone calls and came walking through doors when they did arrest me that expedited my release. So therefore, them silencing me or taking away my First Amendment right speaks more so to the question of what exactly was the purpose of this exercise. Was it really to disarm me or was it to shut me up? because of the fact that the popularity and the message of inspiration across the black community that was being seen as a direct result of the manifestation of the NFAC was something that would probably run counter to some of the gun proposal policies of the incoming administration. If you study George, uh, study Joe Biden's gun plan, folks like myself and organizations like the NFAC and even white militias would find it almost impossible, extremely expensive to own the firepower that the Constitution allows us to own today. Uh, so I think that there's some things that, some decisions that may have been made at higher levels that we need to start to dismantle this culture that has developed in America over the last eight to 12 years, where we now have these groups of armed citizens of polarizing views that at some point may initiate some type of conflict, even though the NFAC has never attacked anyone, has never threatened anyone. The NFAC has never had to fire a shot nor had a confrontation with anyone. We have a completely zero track record because we operate within the confines of the law. Uh, you mentioned that your organization is an inspiration for black people and I know the point is not to be an inspiration for white people per se, but I've got to tell you, uh, uh, your organization that they see is quite inspirational to white folk, just so you know. Um, people I've talked to have spoken that very highly of NFAC for being present and balancing what looks like a very unbalanced situation with white militias showing up, waving guns and, and weapon, weaponry um, on federal property around federal agents, um, but also just, you know, in general to, to see the strength of somebody stepping forward to organize the black community in the face of what we're seeing now with white militias. I think what's interesting about the current situation is that when you start to look at the fact that the NFAC has, has operated uh, within a certain methodology uh, that, as you said, does kind of land us in the middle, bringing sanity to an insane situation, yet not going over the edge, taking up with the chaos, which is what it has the potential to do. Most people would think that when you introduce guns into, into a protest, that all of a sudden there is, the risk is increased. What people fail to realize is once violence is initiated within a protest, it is no longer a protest. It is a riot, and that in itself is a crime. So people are uh, confusing protests with rioting tend to believe that the introduction of unorganized guns, I would agree, would result in some form of chaos. But organized, well-regulated, well malicious, present at these protests, simply as a show of force not to engage, not to provoke, uh, not, to, not, not to be an uh, incendiary to anyone. Just a show of what militias have been in history. They are political tools. They are a, an exclamation point at the end of a sentence. They are not there to attack anyone. They're there to defend their point if necessary or if negotiations break down to at least be able to retreat, uh, to beat a, a, beat a, a hasty retreat.
history and fashion. That's the purpose there. So when you think about the fact that, number one, you're talking about a group that follows a leader. When most folks have tried what they call these centralized movements, but there's no central spokesperson. Everyone's pretty much operating like a McDonald's franchise. They're doing their own thing, Burger King. Uh, but here we have a structure, and I think that's something that a lot of folks uh, we try to exemplify as a blueprint. NFAC was a blueprint for other people, folks to emulate. So we can bring chaos, to, I mean, bring order to a chaotic situation. Now, we also we developed this methodology of holding each other accountable within the group, uh, identifying uh, what our goal was, not just going in to be there. You know, we had to have a specific reason. Uh, Justice for Rihanna Taylor was a prime example. Uh, making sure that uh, everybody, even no matter how you felt about the situation, maybe you just weren't cut out for this particular type of, of, of organization. Making sure we screen a lot of those folks out. And, and last, last but not least, uh, making sure that we realize that life is bigger than social media. This is not social media. This is the real world. Uh, we, 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 we don't talk on social media uh, unnecessarily. We try not to get caught up in the social media world and some of the rumors and some of the, you know, you know how social media is. Uh, we operate in the real world, just like we, we follow folks like yourself. We follow the journal. We follow the, the times. We follow everyone. We want to stay abreast of what's going on. We're not just a bunch of folks with guns. I think that's the difference here is that a lot of these folks don't understand that there's a difference between meeting up and then assembling. There's a very big difference between implementing systems where we understand both sides so we don't make a mistake. This is not this is the work that wasn't being put in. So folks who had high marks uh, for the NFAC, I've noticed those things. They've communicated that to us. Uh, we have a clear-cut mission, and we have a clear-cut purpose. Whenever we show up, we're there just for that. We can't be swayed from it. We're not pulled into anything else. Uh, we're not, you know, you can't come and give us some last-minute breaking news that's going to make us fly over the top. We don't work that way. Uh, we're very, very regimented. That's why this current situation uh, is so interesting to me. Uh, because anyone who's ever watched me, even publicly on some of the TV shows, have heard me say it many times. Do not point your weapon at anyone unless they point one at you first. That is my opening briefing at every formation is to cast cast it on camera. Yet all of a sudden, I'm supposed to have done the opposite. And that's where we are, and I'm going to add that. It's interesting that... Well, that's a matter of perspective. We don't come across as threatening to anyone. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I mean, to, I mean, to law threatening to law enforcement or well, to the I, government. I would, have, I would have to disagree with you there, and, I, and, I, and this is why this is so ironic. Most of the law enforcement agencies that the NFAC has had to encounter in gaining permits and you know getting you know safety buffers set up and trying to brainstorm ways for things not to go wrong. Most of those agencies have been very professional, and you know, and they, 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 it, it wasn't that they didn't do things begrudgingly. They, they they did what they had to do. They learned some things about us, okay, and they've admitted that. I've been a couple of places where they showed up, like you said, uh, not too happy we were there. But by the time it was over, these guys were like, "Wow, you guys really were professional. You were very organized. You followed. You did exactly what you said you were going to do, even when things happened." It had nothing to do with you. They could have taken us somewhere else. You stayed. We appreciate that. You made our job very easy. So it's not so much law enforcement per se that is intimidated by us. It is those members within law enforcement who still carry some of the same mental stereotypes that throw back to the 60s and the 50s. They're still around. Or they learn these, these 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 beliefs, and it impedes their judgment or their execution of their office as an officer. Those are the people when they see the very same people that they know that there's been this unfortunate track record of shootings. And when you see those folks getting organized, when you see those folks getting armed, when you see those folks protecting themselves, looking out for their own, self-policing themselves in a proactive fashion rather than the reactive fashion that gets someone shot. You're intimidated by that because of the simple fact that, and I've heard this said many times, just because an organization hasn't committed an act of terrorism doesn't mean that one day they won't. Well, I hate to say this, the police department has proven to us that that's true because as far as the black community is concerned right now, they feel that they're being the victims of a terrorist or a terrorist uh, plot, a 
subjected them at the hands of the police. And the police have yet to address that. You know, no one's saying defund the police in the chaos, but when does the, when does the, 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 the change start? You know, when, when, did, when is it we move from a place that you're waiting to be told to do it? When do you adopt the same mentality that you saw all the big businesses adopt in the wake of George Floyd global protest? All of a sudden, every Fortune 500 company was putting on commercials of very inclusive and, you know, Black Lives Matter. You saw this wave of, you know, but silence from the Fraternal Order of Police, silence from the Police Chiefs Union, silence from the FBI, silence from law. On Friday, you're going to be in court. It's the American Doofus Show. Don't be a doofus. We've been listening to the words of Grandmaster Jay. We've got one small segment to wrap it up. We'll be back with a, uh, another episode to talk about this, actually. We'll be back live tonight at 9 p.m. with a uh, Friday Night Live to discuss this as uh, well as uh, the arraignment. Uh, Grandmaster Jay is being arraigned in Kentucky State Court under gun charges today, Friday, the 18th of December. And uh, we will close out with one small, uh, one small final segment from Grandmaster Jay. Once again, it is the American Doofus Show. Don't be a doofus. Here's Grandmaster Jay. Once again, if you wish to view the video and interview in its entirety, uh, one location you can do so is Drop Dime. Uh, it is the American Doofus Show. I'm your host, Barry Walsh. Don't be a doofus, Grandmaster Jay, right now. In the meantime, um, here's what I really need. I need folks to be aware that this is not history repeating itself. This is people repeating history. And, and, I'm, and I'm, going to be fair, I'm going to be very blunt here is that um, there are those in the community who feel that this is some form of uh, political payback. There are some who feel that this is just good old fashioned call and tell book. Uh, there are some who feel that, uh, as you said before, um, Mr. Walensky, that maybe someone in the government felt threatened by watching this type of activity. Um, we need to spread the word that, uh, that, they, that they raided uh, my home on the anniversary of the assassination of Fred Hamm, who also died in the same type of operation. The only difference was I didn't go out in a blaze of glory. I, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I was told to come out, so I came out. At the end of the day, now we're in a position where I have to now go through the judicial process. And I, and I implore you all to spread the word of what is happening here because this is now happening in the same jurisdiction of the place where I raised the awareness to get transparency into the case of Breonna Taylor, Louisville, Kentucky. So I think that this is something that you want to uh, definitely keep your eye on. Uh, I myself uh, will be negotiating through this maze of legalities and, and on the other side of this hope that uh, we can finish this conversation. And in the meantime, uh, I just need folks to be aware of that, that, that even though folks say this is the home of the brave and land of the free and all of that, there are still those of us who feel as if it's still us against an unequal system. And simply for standing up for our rights or uh, exercising our constitutional rights that we thought applied to all of us, it looks like the same old song again. And I think it's up to folks like yourself to make a difference. Uh, and I'm not just talking to black folks, I'm talking to everyone. It's up to you all to make a difference. You know, that right is right and wrong is wrong. And right now, a great wrong is being committed. Because if they'll do something like this to me, what makes you think they'll stop and not come after you next? I'm counting on your support morally, financially, keep me in your prayers. And the NFAC is not going anywhere. They'll still be there. The question is, where will I be? Thank you, Mr. Bill. That's the American Doofus Show. Don't be a doofus. See you tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Friday Night Live. We'll be talking about this and more.